Today we're going to discuss the urinary system and start out with the what I would call the macroscopic view of the urinary system. And so kind of think of the urinary system as you're going to have your paired kidneys. And those paired kidneys, remember, are going to be retroperitoneal. So a key term is the word that the kidneys are located retro peritoneal. So they're behind the peritoneum. That's why when you get a urinary tract infection or a cystitis or glomerulonephritis, you get that pain that seems to be right into the depth of your back. So if this is my kidney, looking at the basic anatomic structure, the kidney has got a area coming out of it, which I'll go into detail in a minute, but coming out of the kidney. So this is my kidney. Real straightforward diagram. Coming out of my kidney is going to be my ureter. The ureter is going to then empty, so we'll put it in both sides. The ureters are going to, the paired ureters, will then empty into the bladder. As they empty into the bladder, they're going to empty towards the base. And it's going to be something called the ureteral vesicular. junction. It's a very common place for males to develop cancer of the bladder because of the transitional epithelium of the bladder. It's then going to pass into the urethra and then of course the urine will flow out whether it's male or female into the meatus. So the meatus is nothing more than the opening or the end of the urethra. So that's kind of the gross anatomical picture of it. So now let's just kind of take a look at each of those structures individually. Let's take a look at a kidney. So kidneys are not, as I say, very exciting when you think of the macroscopic picture. But if I was to say this is a kidney, I know the kidney is going to have a outer covering of it. And so the kidney itself, and I'll just use this kind of a darkened pen to distinguish that it's a different layer of tissue surrounding it. So therefore, that's going to be called the renal capsule. And then this dilated portion of the kidney is going to be called the renal pelvis. The renal pelvis is going to empty out through a tube, and that tube is going to be called the ureter. Think of the ureter as really comprised mainly of smooth muscle. and connective tissue. If I again did a fillet really of a kidney, I'd see that there's going to be some structures that are triangular in nature and therefore they're going to be called actually pyramids and I'm just going to draw a few of these in here just for representational purposes. So we'll just put four of these pyramids, as they're called, inside of the kidney. So each of these would be called a renal pyramid. And then at the base of each one of these pyramids, you'll see this opening called a papilla. 
and now located between each of these is going to these pyramids is going to be a structure and those are going to be called a calyx or calyces so each one of these is called a renal calyx and if we were studying in detail for histology, we know there'd be major calyces and minor calyces. And they're really based upon their caliber or the opening of them. Now, as I look at this kidney, there's really going to be a difference between the outer portion of the kidney and the inner portion of the kidney. So I'm going to take and draw this line here, and I'll try and darken it with a kind of a dark pen that will kind of show it a little bit more detail so you can kind of see it as you're looking at it. But what I'm really doing is I'm really demarcating the line between the two portions of the kidney. So this outer portion, which is really from here to here, this encircled area right here, that's going to be called the renal cortex. And then this region from here to here is going to be the renal medulla. And so therefore, we're going to try and picture that this again, again, is what I would call a macroscopic view. Which remember, macro means giant. So it's really looking at this with the naked eye without the use of a microscope. So now that we've got this kind of a, what I would call a, a big picture of what the kidney looks like, let's now just take a look at what's really located inside of these kidneys. And so therefore, the kidney has something called a functional unit. So just like when we talked about bone we said there was a functional unit called an osteon or if we were talking about muscle we said there was a functional unit called a sarcomere the functional unit of the kidney is going to be called the nephron and there's literally millions of nephrons inside of each kidney that's why you've got such residual capacity but to draw a nephron it's a very kind of a unique looking structure, but a real simple way to draw it is just kind of come in and then you're going to come and do that into a circle and come out. And then surrounding that, you're going to come up and down and around and out. And therefore, that is going to be an individual nephron. So now we want to label really the portions of the nephron. And for right now, we'll make this real simple. And I'm going to draw it one more time, a little bit larger. But this portion here is going to be called the glomerulus, or the ball of capillaries. These are going to be blood coming into the kidney and blood coming out of the kidney. And so the first thing we want to get here is the concept that there's a glomerulus, there's something called a Bowman's capsule, and then once we go around this Bowman's capsule, this region all in here is going to be called the renal tubule. Now the significance really of this is when we go back and think about blood flow. So there's some terms I had you memorize at the beginning of the semester. One of them was TBV. Remember TBV stood for total blood volume. In total blood volume, we're going to use the magic number of five liters or 5,000 milliliters. So that's your number that we're going to use for the total blood volume in the body. But I know that to supply these millions of nephrons, I'm going to have to have a renal artery. 
So each kidney is going to have a renal artery, so that's going to be the renal RBF, which is called the renal blood flow. And the renal blood flow is going to have the magic number of 1.25 liters per minute. And that's for both kidneys. So whether I had one kidney or two kidneys, just by measuring my renal blood flow certainly would not tell me whether I have one or two functional kidneys. Now I'm going to take that blood that's coming in here. So kind of think that I've got five liters of blood passing through the body. I'm going to take one-fourth of that blood because 1.25 equals one-fourth of the TBV, of the total blood volume. That blood then is going to separate into millions of nephrons and enter this structure here, which we're going to go to the next page and just draw a little bit larger. But for right now, I'm just going to call this a AA or an afferent arteriole. And then I'm going to pass into this glomerulus. And from the glomerulus, I'm going to produce filtrate. So what's going to be produced here is going to be filtrate. And therefore, filtrate's where I'm going to get the term of GFR. And that stands for glomerular filtration rate. And the glomerular filtration rate is going to be a magic number of 125 milliliters per minute. That's the number we all associate with something called the renal clearance, or sometimes we associate with the word the creatinine levels. So that is again just the big picture of the kidney. So if this is a renal artery bringing blood in, is bringing it into one of these millions of afferent arterial. It's going into a ball of capillaries producing filtrate. That filtrate is going to then pass through the series of renal tubules. What doesn't pass through will come out of this tube here called an EA or an efferent arterial. And that's eventually going to pass into the renal vein. And then, of course, in this renal tubule here, we're going to filter and reabsorb and we're going to secrete. And it's not until we get to this CT here or collecting tubule that we're going to actually produce urine. So that's the what I would call the big picture of an nephron. And picture those literal little tiny dots that are really seen inside of that cortex. So if I was to just, again, just making that really big drawing of that kidney, just for t purposes of just understanding a real simple concept here, if this is the kidney, and this is my pelvis, and this area surrounding it here are going to be my a cortex. If I look at that with the without a microscope, I'm going to see literally these tiny little black dots that are going to be located inside of that. Remember, this region here is going to be called the renal cortex. This region here, where we're going to have our pyramids, is going to be the renal medulla. And of course, this region here is going to be called the renal pelvis. So if you kind of picture this hilum of the kidney, and again, just drawing that kidney piece at a time, here's that same kidney. But now we just want to see how blood is coming in or out. If this is my hilum of the kidney, remember the hilum of the kidney is just like the hilum of the lung. So that's going to be the hilum. The hilum is where structures enter or exit. So coming into the hilum of the kidney, 
is going to be the renal artery. So that's my RA, the renal artery. Coming out of it is going to be the renal vein, the RV. And then, of course, the third structure coming out of there. And that is going to be the ureter. So now we know that it's this renal artery that's going to split off into millions of nephrons and the end effect is going to be filtration. So if we now just draw that nephron one more time and now just label the pieces of it. So we're coming in, we're going out. There's our nephron. Over here was the renal artery. Remember the renal artery was had bringing blood in at 1.25 liters per minute, one fourth of the total blood volume. That blood then entered into the AA or the afferent arteriole. It's going to pass through the G. And remember, G is going to be the glomerulus or the ball of capillaries. The, the blood is eventually going to go into this space between the glomerulus and the BC. And the BC is the Bowman's capsule. And it's in that region between the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule that we're going to be producing filtrate. That filtrate now is going to pass through the Bowman's capsule. It's going to pass then into the descending limb so that's the descending limb of the tubule system it's going to pass through the PCT PCT stands for the proximal which means from the beginning convoluted which means twisted, just like it's showing here, tubule. The descending limb is then going to go into the loop of Henle. So this thickened region at the bottom here is going to be my LH, or my loop of Henle. And of course, the loop of Henle is significant because that's where we're going to have the action of a loop diuretic. So if you think of the patients on Lasex or furosemide, its target is going to be at the loop of Henle. Then we're going to take that same filtrate. So remember, blood came in, blood went through the glomerulus, and blood came out through the efferent arteria, the EA. And eventually, that blood then went into the RV, or the renal vein. And the blood that came into the renal and to the afferent arterial came from the RA or the renal artery. So blood came in, passed through the afferent arterial, passed through the glomerulus, produced filtrate, and of course if we had 1.25 liters per minute and we produce filtrate at the rate of 125 milliliters per minute, that's actually one-tenth of the RBF. 
So if we started out with 100% coming in, 90% of it went right back out into the renal vein, and 10% of it would became filtrate. But of course, we don't produce 125 milliliters per minute of urine, so now it has to go through a tubule system. It passes through the Bowman's capsule, it passes down into the descending limb, through the pox and proximal convoluted tubule, through the loop of Henle, then to the distal convoluted tubule, DCT. So that's your DCT or distal convoluted tubule. And of course, since it's going upwards, we're really calling this the ascending limb. And then it's finally going to come and form urine in the CT. And the CT equals the collecting tubule. So again, this is where total blood volume comes in. If you just think of those magic numbers, TBV, total blood volume, 5,000 milliliters or five liters, RBF, renal blood flow, 1,250 milliliters or 1.25 liters, GFR, 125 milliliters. And the magic of those numbers is that 1250 is actually one fourth of five or 25% and 125 is actually one tenth or 10% of RBF. So in effect, our kidneys are only 10% effective of filtering our blood per minute. All right, so that is the, the nephron, all right? Now, we also know that we got to draw just one more simple drawing without all of this kind of what I would call extra structures showing on there to simplify it. So if we just make this kind of a very quick diagram again, here's going to be the nephron. I'm not going to label all of these pieces again. But I do know that coming here is, this. remember, this is the renal artery, in effect, sent blood in. Remember, this is going out into the renal vein, back in the systemic circulation. And therefore, coming out of this renal vein are going to be a series of capillaries. They're going to wrap their way around the tubules and go right back into the renal vein. And therefore, those are called my peritubular capillaries. And so therefore, a couple things we've really answered here. If you remember when we started the class, we said what organ controls our blood pressure. And of course, the answer is going to be the kidneys. Why? Because we've literally got millions of arterioles. Because each nephron, of which there's millions of them, has an afferent arteriole and an efferent arteriole. It also shows us that we can use different diuretics and using different electrolytes in that. We can filter the filtrate. We can secrete a secretion like ions, electrolytes. And then finally, we can reabsorb. So when my body's kind of control its electrolyte volume, it can actually use these kidneys in different portions of the tubule in order to filter the blood, in order to secrete ions or electrolytes. If I've got too much in sodium, if I've got too much potassium, if I don't have enough hydrogen ion, and it can also reabsorb. So that's why kidneys are so important. And because we've got so many millions of nephrons, 
we really don't know that our kidneys are failing until all of a sudden they get to somewhere about 40% of their effectiveness and all of a sudden we're really in end-stage renal failure. So now we know we've taken blood, we've filtered the blood, we've sent the blood back into the renal vein, and we've collected, created urine, because it's urine that's actually coming out of this CT or this collecting tubule. And we know that when we're looking at these kidneys, we're actually taking and sending them into the bladder. So just remember that your bladder is going to be smooth muscle. It's going to be involuntary. So if this is my bladder here, so again, just making it very simplified, here's my bladder. Remember the bladder's got these ureters that are bringing urine from the kidneys and then it's going to pass into this urethra. There's actually going to be two sphincters located at the neck of the bladder. There's going to be a sphincter approximately right here and there's going to be one a little bit distal to it. The first sphincter we're going to come upon is going to be called the external urethral sphincter. I'm sorry, internal. The first one we're going to hit is the internal urethral sphincter. It's internal, so therefore it's proximal to this distal external. So that's going to be smooth muscle. And I always say that the internal urethral sphincter is going to say, I've got to go. So the pressure wave of the bladder filling up with urine is going to put pressure on this smooth muscle and sending signals to you and telling you, I've got to urinate. But since I want to urinate not in a public place and I want to get to the bathroom, I'm going to have to then come to this second sphincter, and that's going to be called the external urethral sphincter. And that's going to be skeletal muscle. And therefore, that's going to say, not now or not here. So people always think of the bladder as that you can control your bladder. Well, you can't tell your bladder to urinate. You can only cause pressure increases in it. The internal sphincter then sends signals to your brain telling that your bladder is now full. And then you control your bladder with the external urethral sphincter. So think of a person that's a quadriplegic, he produces urine. The problem is he has no control of his external sphincter and therefore he's incontinent. Mm -hmm.